tonight on the final play. It's across the board. We'll put that tape on tomorrow. Um, there weren't a lot of good things. An ugly outing in Houston has put several Saints on notice. And honestly, it's been kind of pedestrian from him throughout the camp. Jim Henderson will stop by to help us sort out the good, the bad, and the ugly. Plus. West Bank, man, always. Keenan Lewis was released on Friday. We'll look back at the three years he spent in his hometown. And the latest in college football news, a look into why the NBA chose New Orleans and catching up with a red-hot former Tiger that's tearing it up in Texas. From Fox 8 Sports, this is the final play. Brought to you by Southern Quality Ford Dealers and Oceana Grill. Welcome into the final play. I'm Juan Kincaid. 24 hours later, and it's okay to still be a little frustrated with what you saw from the Saints in Houston last night. It's like we're living in a bizarre world. The defense has continued to look better than the offense has. In fact, the O, led by Drew Brees, hasn't brung it in either preseason game. But Sean Payton admitted that last night's performance was an all-time low. Here's Sean Bazan from Houston. For the Saints, the midway point of their preseason is here and trends are starting to develop. Some good and some bad. We'll begin with the bad. Once again, the Saints showed a tendency for turning the ball over. They had two Saturday. It started early after the defense forced a quick three and out. On the ensuing punt, Marcus Murphy fumbled the ball for the second week in a row. But this time, he wasn't able to recover it. And Sean Payton wasn't happy. We talked about the, the turnover. We get a three and out to start the game and the first punts on the ground. Um, that's you know it just it just can't happen we'll find another returner i caught the ball you know guy just stripped it a fumble that can't happen you know i have to come out and improve next week that fumble eventually led to a texans touchdown strike from brock osweiler to will fuller but murphy wasn't the only player to draw the ire of the head coach so too did brandon coleman whose inconsistency through the preseason is starting to wear on Peyton. honestly it's been kind of pedestrian from him throughout the camp but you're, there's certain things you see and you see and you see and you see and then all of a sudden they reveal themselves they reveal themselves in a game and you know what not surprised as we go through OTAs and then preseason and everything else I mean listen there's a lot of I think growing still to do for all of us um, and yeah he's one of those guys of course you know any young player you know each each year especially in those years, one, two, three, four, you, you know, you want to see those strides and those increases. Um, and, and listen, I, th I think there's some things that he's done well. I, I certainly think that you know, he would say there's some things that he could do better. But perhaps the most concerning trend is the offensive line. Breeze was sacked once but took several big hits when the first teamers were on the field. Plus, they failed to pave the way for a running game. Part of the problem. But look, there's going to be a lot of dirty hands when we watch that tape. All right, starters, frontline guys, a lot of dirty hands. But not everything has been bad. There has been some growth. Unlike last week, this week the Saints defense neutralized the offense's two giveaways with two takeaways of their own. P.J. Williams even prevented a touchdown with a pick in the end zone. Yeah, I was encouraged with that. It was a big red zone stop. I mean, that's a, a point saver. And despite being faced with bad field position for most of the first half, the defense only yielded 16 points total. But overall, Peyton wasn't in a mood to put a positive spin on his team's performance. That's one of the balancing acts of the preseason when you have 90 players. There's there's a part of you as a coach that saw them, some things that you're encouraged about, but I'm telling you what, offensively, and it's across the board. We'll put that tape on tomorrow. Um, there weren't a lot of good things. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. The Saints will have two more preseason games to get it right. Both will be in the Dome, so maybe that'll help. This Friday night, Pittsburgh will be here, followed by a Thursday night preseason finale against the Ravens on September 1st. Both games will be live on Fox 8 with more from NRG Stadium once again. Here's Sean Bazan. Joined now by the voice of the Saints, Jim Henderson. And Jim, you were right. I got to give you credit. Uh, before the game, you and I talked, and you said this team could be ripe for a sloppy game just because of the, their schedule throughout the training camp and the preseason. Turns out you were dead on. Well, I, I thought this was a tired football team. 
maybe not as much physically as mentally, been gone three and a half weeks, and you compare them to the Texans who had a game under their belt, as the Saints did, but a victory in San Francisco and a chance to come home in front of the home folks who were seeing Brock Osweiler for the first time. He played much better than he did in San Francisco. He had a little something to prove, though it's early in preseason. So I, I just think with all the three and a half weeks being gone away, and I've never seen the Saints have to go on the road twice mm -hmm. to practice against another team. So as you're packing and unpacking, I think this was a tired football team that practiced on Thursday against the Texans because of the travel, because of the short night, because of the heat and humidity. So I just thought that comparing the two teams, there's a great opportunity for the Texans to have a lot going in their favor and the Saints to say, hey, we're going home regardless in three and a half hours. Turns out you're pretty good at this football thing. You, you no, got a future in this business, no, you know what I'm saying? I'm not sure about that. I was lucky for a change and I'm not sure if I was happy that I was. Um, you know, it's preseason, so you, you expect some mistakes, and as, as a coach and as a team, you probably want a few mistakes to teach off of, but what have you separated as preseason mistakes versus legitimate concerns? I think the offensive line is a legitimate concern. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, if Teron Armstead isn't then there, it's huge, and when he is, it gets a little more solid. But this is the team I don't think that has any any depth along the offensive line. And even with the starters in there, I'm just not impressed with their play. I think that's going to be a problem for this football team. And then you looked at some of the people that, that Sean pointed out personally, and those are obviously his concerns because he, he was very forthright about it and very candid about his concerns about Brandon Coleman, uh, about Marcus Murphy. But as he said, there are dirty hands all over the place on this football team after tonight. Why don't we stay right there because he was very pointed, uh, as you just heard, um, with Brandon Coleman, with Marcus Murphy, very direct. Um, basically called Brandon Coleman pedestrian, said Marcus Murphy, we, we may have to get a new returner. Um, what do you think he's trying to do by being that pointed in a press conference like that? Well, I think he's trying to light a fire under Brandon Coleman, and that seems to be hard to do. He just doesn't seem to have a persona on yeah. the field. That it, right now, it looks like it's too big for him, it's too physical for him, and I'm not sure he's ever going to turn the corner into being the kind of player the Saints hoped he would be, and that's a, that's a guy that's going to succeed Marcus Colston in that role. You know, when you're that big and that lanky, you're going to take some shots. Marcus Colston took a lot of shots, too, but survived them. I'm not sure Brandon Coleman has what it takes internally to survive that kind of physical play. So I think he's trying to light a fire under Brandon Coleman. And I almost think with Marcus Murphy right now, it's time to back off because the poor kid is so tight. He's shown his ability. He had the touchdown last yeah. year against Carolina with the punt return. He had the return last week, but after he put the ball on the ground again. And that's the last thing you want to see. You're, you've stopped the team. You're ready to get your hands on the football offensively. Then he gives it away. That can't happen. The very first thing that you have to do as a punt returner is catch the ball. Make the first guy miss is your second thing. And your third thing is try to make what you can out of the return. But first of all, you've got to catch the ball. And that's been his problem. The thing that I would think about with Marcus Murphy, I think he kind of gives you some juice as a third down back yeah, yeah. as a runner and a receiver out of the backfield, but he may never get a chance to do that because he can't return the ball successfully. You just think the opening punt return that was fumbled and then that big catch that should have been a catch down the scene with Brandon Coleman, how different this game would have been had those two plays uh, not happened. Um, but on the, on the flip side, Keenan Lewis uh, was obviously uh, released by the Saints. Bit of a surprise. Sean Payton said, look, it's about availability. Wasn't really uh, able to be on the field. But it ultimately shows he's got some faith in some young corners. You got P.J. Williams. You got Devontae Harris. You got King Crawley. I think all three of those guys played well and have played well throughout different spots in this camp. I agree. Ken Cr uh, Crawley could have had an interception yep. tonight for a touchdown. He jumped that route, had the ball right in his hands, but at least he was there to make the play. You saw guys challenging passes on the periphery, which in years past you, you really never saw. So, yeah, I think there's reason to be excited uh, and optimistic about these young corners and these young players in the secondary. Um, so I, I think that was probably... Probably a move that certainly caught everybody's attention, for one thing, and I think they're going to be successors to Keenan Lewis. And the whole idea is it doesn't matter uh, what your ability is if you don't have availability. And that's another thing that Sean pointed out right away. It's been a year since the yep. surgery, and he's still not ready to go. Uh, lastly, Jim, here we are, the uh, midway point of the preseason. Everyone now shifts back to New Orleans, which I think I talked to a few of the players in the locker room. They're like, yes, it is time to get back mm -hmm. home. I'm curious, though, do, do you have a gauge on this team yet? 
I don't think so. I think if you're going to get a gauge on this team, it'll be next week when the starters are going to go probably at least a half. You might get a little feeling about them then. The Steelers, meanwhile, were, were shut out by Philadelphia on Thursday night, 17 nothing. So they'll be trying to put it together as well. It'll be good to get home, to perform in front of the home folks. That hasn't always been great for the Saints in recent years. But I think this game will answer maybe not everything, but more questions than the first two games certainly could. Coach Payton has placed an emphasis on winning preseason games, but they've lost seven, seven straight, straight dating back to 2014. Jim Henderson, thank you, sir. You got it. Thanks a lot, Sean. Training camp continues this week over on Airline Drive, and practices, weather permitting, will be open to the public. Tomorrow's workout, 3.30 to 5.30 in the afternoon. Tuesday and Wednesday, they will go in the morning from 9.30 until 11.30, then back to the afternoon workout for Thursday at 3.30. And, of course, the game against the Steelers Friday night, again on Fox 8, kickoff at 7 o'clock. Still to come. The Saints made a surprise move on Friday by saying so long to hometown veteran Keenan Lewis. The reason why, from both sides, is straight ahead on the final play. You're watching the final play. Nick Fairley, as talented as he's shown he can be during his brief NFL career, he's also been a cancer for the teams he's previously played for. Or he's underachieved. Whatever the reason is for him ending up with the Saints, Sean Payton will take because with first round pick Sheldon Rankins on the shelf for six weeks, Fairley may have to lead the front line charge. And last night he showed glimpses of being okay with that. Here's Garland Gillen. And good pressure again. Chasing him down from behind, Nick Fairley. Nick Fairley demonstrated again last night that the Saints got a steal in free agency with his signing. The black and gold locked in the former Auburn star for a one-year, $3 million deal this offseason. The Mobile native has been wreaking havoc on the line since the ink dried on his contract. Oh, yeah. You know, we just that's something we're going to harp on as a D-line this year. Just going out, you know, knocking the line of scrimmage back, you know what I'm saying, getting out to the old line, then getting out the quarterback when the task come. I thought we had some pressure. Uh, it would be hard for me to comment until I put the tape on, but um, we had a good rotation going. Um, hopefully uh, it was more good than, than negative. It's only been two preseason games, or not to the regular season just yet. So Fairley's taking his camp success with a grain of salt. Just keep working my butt off, get in the film room, see what I've messed up on, like force my MAs and technique-wise, and just better than each and every day at practice. And game's gonna come a lot easier. Fairley needs to step up with a decimated defensive line. John Jenkins is a no-show most of this camp, and first-round pick Sheldon Rankins is also on the sidelines. That's part of the game, and things like that happen. And just. I just got to pick it up and just keep moving forward. Defensive lineman Sheldon Rankins broke his fibula in West Virginia. His return should be around the bye week, which is week five of the regular season. From Houston, Garland Gillen for the final play. For more Saints news and analysis at your fingertips, check out our new Final Play app. Be sure to download the new app for Saints coverage. And as a bonus, when you download it, you have a chance to win a Final Play getaway, which includes sweet tickets to a Saints game, dinner for two, and a hotel stay for two nights. The day before the Saints kicked off against the Texans, the front office decided that it was time to move on from veteran cornerback Keenan Lewis. His release after three seasons certainly a surprise one, but truth be told, West Bank wasn't a part of game day plans much last season anyway. He battled hip and knee injuries most of last season, missing 10 games, only took part in one training camp practice at the Greenbrier this month. And now that he's gone, the roster is flooded with guys that have two years or less experience, which is what this team can't replace. Hopefully, they can match his production, though. During his first two seasons in black and gold, Lewis was the team's best corner, totaling six interceptions and 26 pass breakups in those first two years. But the injuries took their toll in year three, playing in just six games, only two pass breakups. Here's Coach Payton's reason on why this move had to be made now. Now, it was just, listen, at the end, for us, it's always a, a difficult decision, and you know he's 52 weeks post-surgery. Just, just availability. Uh, ultimately, um, that's a challenge. Um, you know, we wish him well. Um, I think ultimately it was it was just trying to get him on the field. You know, it's just been seems like a long time. 
first off, man, I want to thank all my fans for the three years I was here, man. I got the opportunity to play in my hometown. It was an awesome experience, and it's time to move on, man. God got me. I got faith. I've been grinding 24-7 this summer, man. I'm excited. It hurt me that I got to leave my city, but that's why they make TV. Y'all can always stay tuned. I'm getting sharp. I'm back. I'll be back better than ever. I'm excited for the upcoming season, and... Just waiting on a new journey, man. Life got to move on, and that's how it goes. So, of course, it's time to project the makeup of the Saints' cornerback room. It'll be Young, led by Delvin Bro. P.J. Williams' interception last night reminds us that he may be ready to take over for Keenan. A pair of rookies have looked the part in Ken Crawley and Devontae Harris, and then there's Damian Swan should be in the mix as well. If he can stay healthy, and by staying healthy, we mean staying away from concussions that sidelined him most of last season. When we come back, we switch gears and talk college football with campus stops to Baton Rouge and Hammond America. Stay with us. And for much more Saints coverage, check out our photo gallery from last night's game. You can find these shots and much more on our Final Play app and, of course, on fox8live.com. In LSU's team boardroom, a show of solidarity with the people of Louisiana, and especially the thousands that have been affected by the floodwaters. A banner that reads, in part, for Louisiana, for team, and for self. I have the, the, the same um, human um, weaknesses and strengths, uh, and uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know that I am prepared, to be honest. I, uh, I, I, w I went through some some difficult times, and uh, and I've, I've been f fortunate to be around great teams and, and men that, that that really wanted to take that on. And uh, um, I think yeah, I think the leadership that I've had in this room has been spectacular. And I don't know that uh, that I need to take any credit for that. There are so many things that are going on around the LSU football team right now that have absolutely nothing to do with playing football. But the business of the game goes on, and LSU's preparations for Wisconsin do as well. They'll go into that September 3rd game at Lambeau Field against the Badgers, ranked fifth in the country, at least according to the Associated Press, who put their first poll out this afternoon. The Tigers are one of six SEC schools in the top 25. And they're all led by the Alabama Crimson Tide. They got 33 first place votes, but not all of the voters are stuck on Bama. Plenty of love for Clemson at number two, Oklahoma's third, Florida State's fourth. They're the Tigers with their one first place vote. They're fifth. The other SEC schools in the top 25, Tennessee, Ole Miss, Georgia, and Florida. And there's this piece of news that's not good news for the Tigers. Massive offensive lineman Willie Allen looks to be headed to a redshirt season after suffering a knee injury that will require surgery. The 6'7", 310-pound John Curtis alum is one of four offensive linemen in the Tigers' freshman class. Meanwhile, up the road in Hammond, Southeastern's got a couple of scrimmages under their belts now, and they've looked better each time out, which is exactly what head coach Ron Roberts wants to see. And expectations are high for the Lions. They're one of four Southland teams to get votes in the inaugural FCS poll. Southeastern opens on the road at Oklahoma State October 3rd as well. It's a game that Roberts will use to evaluate his talent. I, yeah, I'd rather not open with a conference play. I mean, I like the idea of getting two games, work some kinks out, you know, find out who can play. You get, like, in these games, we're going to play, I mean, we're going to try to play, go up there, and we're going to try to play a lot of guys. We're going to play a lot of guys, try to evaluate them. Who can, who can step up on game day and make plays for us? Who can step up and do their job? Who's going to elevate their level of play? And with that, we're a week closer to the start of the college football season, and all of our teams open on the road. Tulane with a Thursday night game, a start at Wake Forest on September 3rd. LSU again on the road, nationally televised game at Lambeau Field against Wisconsin. Southeastern making the trek to OSU. Nickel State, they get their season underway in week two against Georgia. We're rounding the final turn here on the final play. Straight ahead, what in the world has gotten into former LSU slugger Alex Bregman?
watching the final play. What was suspected about a month ago became official on Friday. The NBA's All-Star Game is coming back to New Orleans. It'll be the third time in 10 years that the Crescent City has hosted the league's All-Star festivities. No other city can claim that. New Orleans became the favorite to host once it was taken away from Charlotte because of a state law that limits anti-discrimination protections for members of the LGBT community. So the Queen City's loss ends up being the Crescent City's gain. It just reinforces the fact that New Orleans is a major uh, sporting event uh, uh, destination and a national model for sporting events around the country. We have an opportunity to marry the celebration of basketball with the celebration of life that's organic to the very nature of what we are here in New Orleans. And I think this is going to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest, NBA All-Star Games in history. Finally tonight, while in Houston, we caught up with one of Major League Baseball's hottest hitters, who just happens to be a former LSU Tiger as well. And as Chris Hagan saw firsthand, Alex Bregman is built for the Major Leagues. It wasn't long ago that Alex Bregman heard his name called on draft night at LSU. The Houston Astros select Alex Bregman. Yeah! That's crazy. Oh, it was last year, this time of year. Now he's transcended several levels of baseball to the show, and he's starting to settle in nicely. That's driven. Out to deep right. On the move to Scotty, and it is gone. And just like that, the team is tied. It's also Bregman is first major league home run. The experience um, is a little bit more at each level. While well, the guys are a little bit older, they, they know what they're doing. They know what, what they're doing, what they're trying to do, to and they execute it. And it um, just gets a little bit better each step of the way, and you got to adapt your game to that. But it wasn't always easy for Alex here in Houston. He was one for his first 34 major league at bats, but says that type of stretch was never anything to panic over. In fact, Bregman says it was at LSU where he learned how to handle those type of situations. My sophomore year, I, I went through a little stretch that was that was rough and learned how to get out of that. And um, it definitely helped when uh, I started uh, up here struggling a little bit. So um, I think that's the biggest thing that I learned from college overall was how to deal with failure and how to get back up when you fall down. But since that stretch, Bregman hasn't looked back. The only thing he sees now is a bright future and still a little bit of purple and gold wherever he goes. I think Toronto is the only city that I didn't uh, see anybody. And then the last day I saw an LSU shirt. So... Um, it's been great support from, uh, from everybody, and uh, they travel well. Reporting in Houston, I'm Chris Hagan for the final play. Don't forget, Saints Camp moves back to Airline Drive for an afternoon workout tomorrow, open to the public starting at 3.30. If you can't make it, Fox 8 will be there. We'll have you covered at 4, 5, 9, and 10 o'clock tomorrow night. For Sean Garland, Chris, producer John Bennett, and photographer Edwin Good, I'm Juan Kincaid. Have a great night. We'll see you next Sunday night on the final play. Final play was brought to you by Southern Quality Ford Dealers and Oceana Grill.